Um, we're going to do this in two parts. I'm going to do a more of a traditional lecture, hey, Angela, um, and share with you some of the findings from my uh, doctoral research study and then frame that in how we approach the work at NBJC. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, NBJC is the nation's oldest civil rights organization, both intentional and unapologetic, and standing in the intersections between racial equity and LGBTQIA plus equality. Uh, what we know is that as long as there have been people, my friends clearly in the audience, I love y'all. As long as there have been people, uh, we've been beautifully and incredibly diverse, and we understand the teaching of Fannie Lou Hamer, which is that none of us are free unless and until all of us are free. Yeah. And the goal, of course, is for all of us to absolutely be free. Uh, we're going to pray uh, uh, for the technology. We want the covering of the spirit of baby face in that versus <laughs> battle. <laughs> we're going to rebuke the spirit of Teddy Riley. Yeah. <laughs> and that connection and invited all of the good energy so that we can get this technology to work with us. It is not in this. Okay, okay, there we go. Yeah. It's gonna be slow. <laughs> right, we go, it, it's a continuous, right? It gotta be <laughs> clear and consistent connection to the broadband. That's usually what trips us, 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 us up. Um, so everyone should be clear that I'm going to engage in this conversation centering black people. Um, I tell people all the time, hey, Brittany, hey, Reggie, I love y'all. I tell people all the time that I don't do gay work, I do black work. Yes. And it's important for me to stand in the intersection so that I can highlight connections that are naturally missed. Uh, but the work that I do is because I care about black people mm -hmm. and I want all of us to get free. And it's anchored in an appreciation for the fact that not everybody treats our babies with the protection that they deserve. So a couple of terms, I don't want to assume that we're all operating from the same baseline. So a couple of terms that I want to use that I don't want us guessing around are as follows. Queer, analogically means that which is different. In our context, it's usually colloquial used to refer to people who are members of sexual minority communities. But in this country, where white people are pejoratively in positions of power, black people are queer. Mm. In a society where we take for granted that most black people are born with are made to have a disability because of how white supremacy works. People with disabilities are queer, mm. right? Um, but I want it in this context to be specific to the fact that we're talking about people with regard to sexual minority status. Mm -hmm. uh, LGBTQ refers to individuals who are engaged in same sex attraction. You might hear me say the term same gender loving. Everybody say same gender loving. Same gender loving. I don't use gay. Gay is a white male political identifier. When people usually talk about the gay agenda, they're talking about things that as a black man are not necessarily that important to me. Mm. So that's what we talk about when we talk about the L and the G. B is refers to bisexual. Those are people who are often erased when we talk about the umbrella. Whole another lecture about why that happens, specific mm. to women more than it does to men. Um, and then the last one is trans. Um, here's the way to think about trans. Gender is assigned at birth. Say that again. Because we yeah, often, y'all already on it. This feels like a lecture. <laughs> often we assume that gender is natural or biological or mutable, when in fact a doctor uses their best tools to guess at what our gender is. They assign a gender to us, they put it on our birth certificate. Bless you, Maxwell. <laughs> if you, when you are thoughtful enough to be able to make a decision, if you agree with that decision, you are cisgender. If you don't, you're trans. That's all it is. Everybody cool with these terms? If not, go to mbjc.org and download our terminology guide. There's more there. I want to be clear that democracy is under attack. Mm -hmm. um, it's January, what, 8th, 9th, and it's already been a long year, mm -hmm. in part because we've seen the ways in which democracy has been under attack. Um, I could have a whole nother uh, conversation at this moment about what's happened to our sister, Dr. President Gay. Um, but she is the latest manifestation of what is a continuation of white supremacist fascists attempting to dismantle our very fragile and very young democracy. I want to be clear in naming that while all of that's going on in our country, while there are so many things that are on fire, our babies are suffering sometimes in silence. Schools in particular are hostile spaces for queer students. Remember again, the origin of the term queer, I mean it with a capital Q. And I'm inviting all of us to be more conscious of the ways in which our babies are suffering and the ways in which we can cover and support them. Schools in this country, for those who missed it, have never been designed for queer students to thrive. Whether we're talking about black students or whether we're talking about students who are often assumed to be members of the LGBTQIA community. Remember, we're talking about babies who were just simply trying to figure out 
the spaces that they're forced to move through in the world that they did not ask to be born into. And most often when we're talking about school-aged children, they haven't necessarily declared a sexual identity, gender orientation. They might be flirting with expression, but it's most often the case that kids who are not performing gender in the ways that adults expect them to are assumed to be LGBTQIA+. And if there's ever been a question about how these things come into relationship with each other, I would just point you to everything that's going on in the great failed state of Florida. I don't know if this is going to play or not. Ground zero for America's latest culture war. This week, the College Board revised its new AP African American Studies course, cutting out material that Governor Ron DeSantis argued was a Trojan horse for left-wing ideology. The board insists it did not give in to political pressure and that these revisions were long planned. But the changes to the course directly impact subjects that were long under fire from Republican and Florida officials. The new course excludes topics like Black Lives Matter, Black Queer Studies, and the debate over reparations from its exam and are now only listed as options for research projects. This week, Ron DeSantis also announced he plans to ban state universities from spending funds on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. This all comes as Florida continues to be the epicenter of new anti-LGBTQ legislation taking place throughout the country. Joining me now is David Johns, director of the National Black Justice Coalition, and Rodrigo Hang Layton, executive director for the National Center for Transgender Equality. So thank you both for being here. David, I want to start with you. The College Board is saying we did not give in. Other people, critics of this, are saying you watered this down to, to make sure that the Republican, including Ron DeSantis, that they were happy. What do you make of the consequences of this, the impact this is going to have, especially on students who are talking about their lived experiences? Yeah, I appreciate the question and want to name how frustrated I am that we're talking about this in Black History Month and not all of the good Black news we could be talking about. The spirit of James Baldwin is with me, who talked about to be Black and relatively conscious in America, so almost always be in a constant state of rage. And I am enraged that DeSantis has engaged in an all-out attack on academic freedom, on free speech, and on core pillars of democracy, including public schools. We got here because this is simply a manifestation of white nationalism. Uh, our public schools have been under attack, and DeSantis deciding that his history is the core curriculum, while parts of my history are maybe at some point offered as an elective, is a reflection of white nationalism. What I know as a black, same gender loving man is that you cannot talk about black history without naming the work of Bayard Rustin, the architect of the civil rights movement and the March on Washington in 63. You cannot talk about feminism structures or struggles without naming Marsha P. Johnson, the black trans woman who helped to st spark the Stonewall Rebellion. It is not possible to move past acknowledging that wherever there is history, there's black history, and wherever there's black history, it's always been queer AF. Specific to your question about the college board, one of the things that enrages me most is the capitulation of adults in positions of power. The College Board is a century-year-old organization that decided to engage in this process being politically ignorant to the fact that DeSantis has created conditions that make it difficult for teachers to want to teach these topics to begin with. That's created conditions where libraries have emptied shelves because they are worried about tripping over an intentionally vague policy. We should all be concerned because at the core, this is about disrupting democracy and preventing the kind of civil discourse that so many people in DeSantis' party privilege when they talk about freedom of speech. And Rodrigo, so many people um, I'll share this, and we'll make it public so you all can watch that um, playback okay. um, to experience it. But I just want to underscore that I fundamentally believe that if we, um, as a community, um, do a better job of protecting black women who love black people, we wouldn't find ourselves in the quagmires that we struggle in. Um, we experienced Dr. Gay being scalped, to use the words of the white supremacist, this year because we failed to protect Kimberly Crenshaw when she warned us about these t attacks last year. Um, and so this will come up in the articulation of what I found from the babies in my study. Um, but as a black man and as a black feminist, I would not be doing my job if I did not say, brothers, we need to do a better job. Mm -hmm. um, so my doctoral study is really centered again on this premise, another black sociologist, Asa Hilliard, who said that he never met a child, in particular a black child who was not a genius. Mm -hmm. He also offered that there is no secret to how we support them we first acknowledge them as human, and we second support them with love. And so much of my mantra, teach the babies, is a beseechment. 
It's a, a, a request for us to acknowledge all of our babies in particular. Black babies should be protected with love. Um, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to the teachings of Bell Hooks, lowercase b, lowercase h, because she wanted you to focus on the words and the work, which reminds us that too often we forget that it is our obligation to defend democracy. Um, there's a part of me that still feels like we missed that um, in the insurrection on January 6th. Um, we missed it when we watched the attacks on affirmative action, continued attacks on DEI. Uh, we are still missing it with a sleight of hand where y'all's um, uh, president, the ex-occupant of the Oval Office, um, is still auditioning to be the fascist in chief. Um, and each of us have an opportunity to ensure that, again, this very young and very fragile democracy of ours is protected. And education is its midwife, it being our democracy. When we think about the experiences of our babies, again, remember the vast majority of public school students in our country at this day and age and Beyonce's year of 2024 are not white, they are not poor, they reflect the global majority, the plurality of society that makes us great and whole. And our babies in particular face unique types of stress that are often not acknowledged and go ignored. For me, what I was really interested in was this idea that people have that those of us who have intersectional identities can choose one. It shows up in conversations with people who say, well, if you're black and gay, then you don't need to be black because the gay folks got you. Folks can't offer an example of when the white gay community has ever got us, <laughs> but they believe it with their whole chest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and in particular, when we think about data and how data is collected and used, the five largest, na the five national data sets, the largest data sets that we use to affect the way that we collect data, that we fund schools, that we defund schools, those data sets don't contemplate our babies as whole. Mm -hmm. Most of the educational data sets don't ask questions that contemplate our babies having sexual identities, gender orientations, or expressions. Mm -hmm. And those that do approach it from a behavioral health risk perspective, YBR, youth behavioral risk data. Yeah. And so I wanted to talk about and really name that there's this false choice that adults hold on to, that policymakers end up acting upon, mm -hmm. that ends up missing opportunities for us to get at root causes. Um, for those who are in doctoral programs, anybody in a doctoral program now? Shout out to Cassandra. Uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, you're going to have one of these, which is your theoretical map, right? This is how all of it comes together in your head. And what I knew is that there's a whole lot of data about black students. A lot of it is um, uh, totalizing and that it really focuses on urban environments. It assumes incorrectly that we don't and haven't always lived in small rural and isolated communities, for example. Similarly, there's lots of research on LGBTQIA plus students. A lot of that research assumes that our babies are all white, are white adjacent, e.g. Asian. And then there's a smaller subsection of research that really talks about what happens in educational settings outside the traditional school setting. Um, so what I termed in my research was this informal educational programs and activities. Think about things like glee clubs or debate teams or GSA programs that might be designed specifically, specifically for LGBTQIA plus students. And so my research really focused on the space where each of those existing bodies of research converged. I had two questions. I was really interested in what factors that we can identify in terms of their connection to a student. So dem uh, demographics, like whether or not they identify as male or female, maybe their socioeconomic status, uh, whether they uh, reflect that they come from a nuclear family, and then intrapersonal and interpersonal effects, their relationship with their teachers, mm -hmm. their relationships with their peers, mm -hmm. whether or not they say they participate in extracurricular activities. I wanted to know how each of those factors could help us predict whether or not students engaged in these informal educational programs and activities. I also wanted to know, it's going too fast, I didn't push that, if there was a distinction between what we found for students who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or same gender loving, and then our students who are trans. I had this hunch before the explosion in anti-trans legislation that we saw last year that there were distinctions that we were missing. And what I found in my data is that I was Right. <laughs> so I was able to complete my data because I was able to access private data. 
I leveraged my privilege as someone who has spent a decade as a senior policy advisor in the U.S. Senate to access data that's not available to the public. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. I'm going to name it as a problem. A part of how white supremacists use data is to prevent us from being able to collect data to solve the problems that they say don't exist because we don't have the data. Yeah, it's all, it's all. So I use the data to supplement my qualitative approach a quantitative approach, and then I supplemented that with qualitative data because I knew that there were things that, go, that would be missed if we simply looked at numbers. And more than that, what I found is that intersectionality matters. Intersectionality is not simply a term that it was created when people started to talk about Kimberly Crenshaw, who was responsible for contributing to critical race theory, not intersectionality theory. Intersectionality theory is a two centuries old practice that native and indigenous people use as a way to understand the world around us mm -hmm. and to shift shit, mm -hmm. in particular to dismantle the tools of white supremacists. Mm -hmm. Black feminists call this the matrix of domination, the signs, systems, and symbols that allow white supremacy to be omnipresent yet hyper invisible. It's the stuff you know you can feel it in your gut, but you might not have the words to be able to name it. Talk. And so what I found is that employing intersectionality mattered because if I did the traditional thing and just ran the numbers, there was so much that I would have missed. There was so much that I would have missed. And I'm going to get into this with these noteworthy findings. If y'all are taking notes, this is the screenshot to take. Age is significant. Age is significant. Too often, we start having conversations with kids when we think that they can understand. If you believe that we should talk to kids when they're in high school about sexual identity, gender orientation, and expression, what I know is that you know very little about child development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you have spent... Not enough time being enrolled in young people making sense of the world around them. Mm -hmm. This is especially true when we think about the trauma that our babies experience as a result of these social constructs that they didn't even consent to. Mm -hmm. Safe spaces matter. Safe spaces matter. The fact that so many of us rock pendants or symbols that remind us of the people that we come from and the power that we have, very much connected to so many tenets of the black power movement. Mm -hmm. That matters to young people. That's why you see people like the failed history teacher, the governor of Florida, criminalizing putting rainbow stickers on doors or pictures of Marsha P. Johnson or images of Byron Rustin because symbolic representation matters, especially for black trans and gender expansive students. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is Aretha was right. Respect matters, mm -hmm. especially for our babies. And this should be no surprise to those of us who understand that a child doesn't care what you know unless they know that you what? Yeah. I love black people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those who love us. Shout out to Timothy and Burnside. So this is to underscore what I mentioned about Aretha being right. What I found using a mi mixed methods approach is that there was statistical significance that was specific to the trans and gender expansive students in my study. I would have missed the fact that for them in particular, symbolic representation mattered, and them understanding that the adult in front of them cared about them mattered to them more than it did to kids who might identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or same gender loving. Before last year, there was an assumption that a lot of people had, which is that we didn't have to talk about queer things within the traditional school day because you could do that in those programs. Mm -hmm. We ain't got to talk about it here, but you can go over there mm -hmm. to do what y'all want to do. Now a lot of that has shifted because the provision of programs that are specific to parts of one's identity, not whiteness, we're going to put that in a box, in a bucket, on a shelf, but parts of one's identity outside of whiteness is now criminalized. Mm -hmm. But what I found in my study is that when accessible and intentional with regard to naming intersectionality, these informal educational programs and activities, these spaces that we can provide for our young people are incredibly beneficial for black queer students. Mm -hmm. Mental health support must be available early. One of the biggest surprises that I found in my study, I was not expecting it, was that every participant in my study who um, identified as a girl or a woman named colorism as something that was toxic and real. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing, to come back to a point I made earlier, is that they all named everyone, regardless of gender orientation, identity, or expression, named black women as powerful yet under-supported resources. So I'm going to go through these, and then Chris and I are going to have a conversation and open it up to the group. 
Um, so I just want to, again, some of this for me became um, unsurprising when I thought about the fact that most of us do best when we are mm -hmm. safe and comfortable, right? The Latin root of the word education is educare, it means to draw out. What I know as an educator is that the process of learning and taking the kinds of risks that are required to demonstrate what you know and have learned or are interested in requires you to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And too often our babies are saying that they're not safe and that we have done them a disservice by naming programs and policy safe spaces that simply mean that we pull the victim into a room mm -hmm. and isolate them mm -hmm. and then affirm what the victimizer is doing by never addressing the root problem. Mm -hmm. So we got to shift beyond the kind of safety that makes adults comfortable so that we are all uncomfortable mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I get real agitated. Let's go back to that slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I get real agitated when I find adults who say to me, I take issue with students who want me to refer to them as they, them, and their, or who have different pronouns on different days. One, you don't care about grammar any other goddamn day of the week. Excuse me, Maxwell. <laughs> So I don't understand why now it's an issue. Two, when you don't know someone's pronouns, they, them, and their is the perfect pronoun to use. The last thing is this. I taught kindergarten and third grade. And I used to get into it with my colleagues, read, the white, read here, white women that worked with me and got on my nerves. Because for them, it was really important that my babies called me Mr. Johns. And what I would say to them was, as long as they're not pissing on the rug or causing harm to other people, I don't really care what they're calling me because I know that it's in love. Mm -hmm. And so if your students want to be called Batman, call them Batman. Mm -hmm. If they want to be respected in whatever way makes them feel good, Toni Morrison says that words are things. Yes. They get onto us. They get in us. Yes. Respect the babies. Ask them, what would you like for me to call you today? Mm -hmm. And honor it. And I'm not saying don't invite parents and adults into this conversation, but adults who, who elect to be educators have a responsibility to put our babies first. Lack of access to thriving spaces facilitates trauma. Insert hashtag duh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a couple of points here. The suicide rates for black youth have doubled in the last two decades. This was pre the introduction of the novel coronavirus. And this stat in particular vexed me one, because kids don't ask to be born. Two, because the suicide rates for every other community of children have decreased over time. Mm -hmm. It's just our babies mm -hmm. who are continuing to say that this is too much. Mm. And that should vex all of us. And what the data shows is that students who identify as members of racial, ethnic minority communities, and sexual minority communities face disproportionate challenges with regard to not only their mental health, but then accessing the kind of support that allows them to navigate safely. We got a whole lot more work to do, including in spaces that we force our babies to move through without the kind of support required mm -hmm. to do so. And in particular, I named this earlier with regard to the finding that age is significant. We have to start providing our babies with mental health support before many of us believe that they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. One of the babies in my study said to me that he was called a black faggot in kindergarten. And it was not until he was in the third grade that he knew what either of those words meant. Mm -hmm. But what he knew was that it didn't feel good. And what I knew was that it didn't feel good because he shared that story with me 20 years after the fact. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so if we don't do a better job of understanding that even when we can't understand, this is where Dr. Enders work comes in, when we don't speak the language of our babies, mm -hmm. when we can't engage in talking through hip hop, we miss opportunities to meet them where they are and where they are hurting. Specific with regard to naming colorism, this is something that we have to do a lot more work to address. Mm -hmm. I smiled as I saw my sister Brittany come in. She's given one of these talks in the past. She was my inspiration for this lecture I'm giving now. But we talk a lot about how colorism is seeping into the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. And we still don't yet have the language to talk to each other about the ways in which white supremacy has us fighting using the master's tools. Mm -hmm. 
And so my hope is that those of you who are in spaces where you're engaged in conversations with young people, you will be unafraid in naming this and allowing them to meet you and invite additional conversation. Mm -hmm. With regard to the so what, this was the point in the defense where my professors were all like, so what you got? <laughs> What's all this mean? I have four things that I think are important. One is that we need to continue to co-construct solutions with the most in need and the least supported in mind. Yeah. Um, sitting in the front row is the superintendent of District of Columbia Public Schools, Dr. Christina Grant. Mm -hmm. And what I remember is that before she assumed this role, y'all can give a round of applause. She does yeoman's work every single day. Um, before she was uh, in this position, she called me. She was in Philadelphia and had a student who was um, gender nonconforming or gender expansive is a term that we use to, to use um, um, non-reductionist language. Uh, and the question was how we create a policy that would center them at an institution where they were the least important person based on their hierarchy. Mm. And so we developed the policy, and then she led the work of ensuring that every single instructor in that space adhered to it. The District of Columbia is also the first school district in our country to develop a policy to support trans and gender expansive young people. Mm -hmm. We have a young person named Ellie and their parents, um, JR and Vanessa Ford, to thank in part for that, but it also took administrators who understood the importance of developing policy by centering those who are furthest away from power in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Grant. We need to continue to center queer students, including in spaces where it is now illegal. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say it again. We need to continue centering queer students in spaces where it is now illegal. MLK Day is in two weeks. Dr. King gave a sermon called, But If Not, one week. I told y'all it's been a long year. Mm -hmm. MLK Day is coming up. <laughs> he gave a sermon called, But If Not, at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And in this sermon, I want you all to find it. He encouraged us to follow the example of three young, what, children, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, who resisted a demigod who showed up in the form of Ronald Dion DeSantis. Mm -hmm. They refused to bow and adhere to his white supremacist fascist rules and said, I will risk being burned in a fiery hell knowing that my God's got me. And even if he don't, I'm not doing that shit you want me to do. Mm -hmm. Our babies don't have a choice. They are compelled to go to school by law. Their parents are sometimes jailed if they don't. Those of us who elect to be in spaces where we can fill the gap are obligated to resist righteously yeah. and in love. Yeah. How we get free is we continue to understand the histories of minoritized people. A lot of what I'm saying ain't new, it's just remixing the way in which God and the ancestors gave it to me. Hmm. But the fact that I know that my queerness is African was written in a book by Sambufu Some. Chapter 13 of The Spirit of Intimacy titled Homosexuality to the Gatekeepers. The words lesbian and gay didn't exist in my village in East Africa, but the word gatekeeper did. Mm. Which vexes me because too many of our brothers and sisters can give space to our native siblings because they got two-spirited folks, but they forget that if everything originated in Africa, then it didn't just skip us. Mm -hmm. So we might not have had lesbian and gay. Yes, those are European terms, but we've always had gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Folks that show up like Brother Bayard and his spirit of organizing and civil nonviolent disobedience. And folks like Marsha P. Johnson, who was like, I'm not dealing with the police harassing us. We just going to fight this out and then organize thereafter. Mm -hmm. Folks like Keith Boykin, the first black Sandra loving person to work for a president to organize a city meeting between LGBTQ advocates and an administration. My colleagues who stand in full force saying that what y'all going to do is stop trying us. If we reclaim ways of being and knowing and affirming one another that are not tainted by white supremacy, I promise you, beloveds, we will all get free. And a part of us getting free is making sure that we are well. Dr. Emin gave the lecture last year at the Black Belt Educators Convening, reminding us that white people will create terms to make you think that you're crazy is crazy. It was based on dripdomania. Mm -hmm. It was so food and it was a reminder that so many of us have this sacral orientation that tells us to do the thing in spite of the fact that there are bullies 
who have been elected and appointed to be bigots who stand in the way. And I know that it's not easy. I know that it don't always feel good. But what I know is if we turn down the white noise, literally, the evidence of the fact that we are and are continuing to win abounds. Mm -hmm. It exists in our babies who tell us this don't feel right. Mm -hmm. This Christopher Columbus dude ain't discover shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the language to say that I ain't slept, I'm experiencing prolonged exposure to trauma, and what I need is a nap and a hug. But if we listen to the babies, mm -hmm. this is where I would queue up and you would hear little boy say, listen, Linda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We can unlock all of the tools that we need in order to mm -hmm. not only get free, but to make sure that our babies are well. Mm -hmm. The last thing that I live by is that we are not designed to have all of the answers. Um, I'm working on birth in my book now, and um, this morning I was remembering um, a time before the internet um, when I couldn't Google stuff, and I would ask my mother, and she would say, go look it up in the what? Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, and because, you know, the Jaws Clay, I like to do an extra, it was Encyclopedia Britannica, the leather bound section, right? Um, and I hated it at the, at the time because I wanted the answer. I, I, I didn't want to have to engage in the labor, but what I appreciate now is the lesson around the importance of appreciating that we shouldn't have the answers, mm -hmm. that there's beauty in discovering the answer, whether we do that by ourselves uh, sometimes in a process called uh, uh, doctoral studies <laughs> that are designed to make you feel like you're crazy, um, or whether we do it in community, uh, in group chats with folks who remind you that um, you're not crazy and the, the way that you see it as precisely as it should be. Um, but whenever you have a question about the way that you should go, especially when children are concerned, my prayer is that you just simply ask the babies. Thank you. Mm. So I, I, I'm assuming it's the point here where we engage in some conversation. Uh huh. <laughs> um, but before we do that, can we can we just um, can we just all put our feet in the ground, just feel the floor real quick, and um, can we all just close our eyes? Can we all take a deep breath in, and as we breathe in, just soak up all the genius we just heard? all the beauty we just heard, all the truth we just heard. Just breathe it in and let it sit in your belly real quick. And then I want you to just breathe out, and I want you to breathe out doubt. I want you to breathe out logic. I want you to breathe out discomfort. I want you to breathe out not wanting to listen. So let that out. And now just breathe in, big breath and then breathe out, and then open your eyes. All right. What you've just heard um, is genius personified. And for me, you know, one of the highlights of the work that I've had the chance to do in academia is having some small part to play in the manifestation of genius. And I would drive four, five, ten hours if you asked me. Thank you. Just for the opportunity to learn. And, and that's what this is for me, an opportunity to learn. Thank you. I want to begin with what was the essence of your presentation and also the essence of the hashtag that is on your shirt in a really interesting context. I think when folks hear you talk about teach the babies, there's a consideration of the idea that you wanna like teach the young ones and give them information and make them be whole and full and well. But I think even in the way you described your work to this audience, there's an element of it where it's like, 
not just teach the chronological babies. The big babies. Teach the folks who are grown adults, yeah. but intellectual babies, yeah. emotional babies, yeah. um, who don't have the capacity to understand the complexity of the human experience. Yeah. I want you to talk through for us what teach the babies means with folks who are our literal babies and those who are grown with positions of authority yeah. that are in many ways so far beneath you in a sense of where they could be to understand the world. How do you develop the capacity to expand the notion of teaching the babies with humility, with love, with recognition of their not knowing, yeah. of seeing the humanity in folks? You're like, you've grown, you should know better. How do you make meaning of, how do you make sense of how to approach that work? Um, given what you do and how you do it. Yeah, in the spirit of radical honesty, it is a work in progress. Um, when I'm at my best, I show up like Mr. Johns, the kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm always best when I'm with young people. Um, this moment is not lost on me that in this first row was a young man named Maxwell. Um, I was in the hospital with his mom when he was born. Mm. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of people in this room who I love, including my frat brother, Bobby Edwards, who's an amazing educator, colleagues in the room, Cassandra at AARP and others. But I trade all of y'all to spend time with Maxwell. Mm. Um, just being enrolled in the process of how they make sense of all of this, I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and to be invited into their world, I find humbling. Mm -hmm. um, and the best thing that the ancestors did for me was to get me quiet long enough to accept the calling of my life, not only to be an educator, but to be an early educator. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the big babies, when I'm at my best, I channel the lessons that they teach me, which are to be patient, mm -hmm. to not assume anything, mm -hmm. to listen and love and to learn, and to be measured in my response. Mm -hmm. And then there's David from Inglewood, California, who was quick to tell people mm -hmm. that I'm not the one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's, beneath the, what's beneath the I'm not the one is, and those who know me, like know me, know me, know this, is that like for me, we don't have time to fuck around. Yeah. Yeah. Like the world is literally on fire. Mm -hmm. and, and what I know and what frustrates me is that a lot of these problems have existed for a lot longer than I've been alive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if Maxwell has to deal with the same things I did that I didn't do my job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so there are times where you don't get Mr. Johns, you get David from Inglewood. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you, if you extend an invitation to dance, then nigga, let's go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the lesson for me this year is to appreciate one new levels, new devils. Mm -hmm. I have been given more responsibility and I know that what comes with that is also mm -hmm. more attempts to knock me off my pivot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if I'm consumed with checking Dave Chappelle because he's transphobic, our little boosie for going to see Color Purple and being pissed off because there's a queer kiss but he clearly didn't read the book because it was written in the pages mm -hmm. by the queer woman who wrote the damn book. Mm -hmm. Or I'm talking about just unhilarious and while her cries for who's gonna protect black women reek of white supremacy and why she ain't done nothing in regards mm -hmm. to advocacy. Mm -hmm. If I'm consumed with that, mm -hmm. I can't be present for the babies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what I love about this, and I think this is, this is what I want folks to, to to glean from not just your presence, but your presentation is that to teach the babies isn't about like bowing down to folks, right? Like sometimes to teach requires a bit of aggression, a bit of force, a, a, bit, of, a bit of forthrightness. And it's a delicate dance to be able to understand the context in which the variations of self have yeah. to be present. Yeah. And that's what you brilliantly articulate. And, and I, I just wanted you to be able to share that with cats, right? Because I think folks miss the magic and it's like we're just supposed to teach them so let's just <laughs> allow them to say whatever they want no now, sometimes to teach you is to put you on game and that requires some fervor yeah. and 
And it's the, it's the incalculable elements yeah. um, of blackness yeah. that give us the sensitivity to know where you lean in, where you not, where you said no, you not, or when you're kind. And I think that's the beauty of, of what you bring to this work. Thank now, you. I'm going to go to the presentation now. You said something that had me in my seat um, feeling tingly. Um, when you talked about safety, safe spaces, yeah. and the ways that isolation yeah. has been framed as a proxy for safety. Yeah. But you, you said it because it was all the gems he was dropping. He was like, you know, you said it and kept going. I was like, nah, slow down, fam. Talk through that for us. Talk through the ways that blackness has been reduced to a selection of a variation of it. Yeah. And not just the isolation of I'm going to extract you from a place and you're isolated and that's a safe space, but the ways that we think that there's safety in our isolating ourselves from the complexities of the human experience and the complexities of blackness. And the, like, you know what I mean? Like, like so folks, like, you're a black man. Choose black masculinity in the absence of all the complexities of who I am. How do we, pl like, play with that idea of isolation, either selected isolation, self-selected, or society-selected isolation and safety, and how that plays out in a black experience? Yeah, you asked a couple of things. Can yeah. we go back to, um, I want to go back to a slide so we can ground this in the words of the babies. Mm. Um, and I'm gonna try and make three points acknowledging that you packed a lot into that. Yeah. Um, one is that safe is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I love a mentor of mine, um, Kevin Jennings, who was the first um, assistant secretary responsible for safe and drug-free schools. Um, and a lot of the work of Kevin and the organization he founded, GLSEN, um, is really premised on this idea of creating safe spaces. Mm -hmm. And the way that that tends to work in public schools is that when a child is victimized by someone, that child is then moved to a physical space where they are often isolated and self-contained, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes the school might then employ, usually what happens is they tap the gay teacher mm -hmm. and say, hey, you up, go administer this program or this club mm -hmm. And seldom is there ever a conversation or redressment of what needs to happen with regard to the victim or the bully or get to the root cause of what caused the issue in the first place. And so for those of us who are in spaces where we engage with young people, I still can't find the slide. This is where Teddy Riley is showing up. <laughs> um, those of us who are engaging with young people, we have an obligation to get to the root of what safety looks like in ways that also acknowledge comfort in their language. Mm -hmm. Um, safety is a term that has been weaponized. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm going to give up in a second. You got it. It's that one. Mm -hmm. Right? So this first sentence does it for me, which is that I felt safe, sure, but I don't know that I felt super cared for. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that came up in my dissertation was uh, students who would name, and again, they would say, sure, I feel safe. I walk through metal detectors. There are police and there are dogs in my school. Mm -hmm. But I know that if you want to get some in, there are ways to get, get around all of that. Mm -hmm. I know that if something's going to go down, the shit's going to go down. Mm -hmm. So this idea that we are not actually thinking about ways to care for mm -hmm. the babies mm -hmm. while we're ensuring safety in ways that make adults feel mm -hmm. more comfortable mm -hmm is never addressing the root issue. You asked a, a part of your question was around uh, masculinity or masculine identity. Um, and for me, I'm trying to do this uh, two things. One is uh, naming the parts of black masculine identity that are toxic because they're based on white male ways of being, yeah. right? And then similar to pointing us uh, back in the direction of Africa and reclamation restoration is appreciating that Often when we are able to show up being vulnerable, mm -hmm. showing up in community, mm -hmm. asking questions of how we can show up in service that we as masculine identified people do better mm -hmm. than when we show up trying to perform the versions of black masculine experiences mm -hmm. that don't benefit any of us. Yeah. 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 So, so a lot. So, so this is what I'm gleaning from what you're saying. 
um, is that, so, like, so I have a science background, and in chemistry there's this, there's this concept called isotopes, right? So you, you'll have hydrogen, and you'll have other forms of hydro hydrogen, and they'll have different numbers of protons and neutrons, but they're all hydrogen. That's right. But the actual compilation of the element are, are, are varied. That's right. And it, it sounds to me as though we collectively have learned to identify an isotope of safety that's not the actual one that that's we right. need. And so there are fabricated notions of safety that's right. that are a part of our identity. That's right. And you're actually naming the most unsafe spaces as safe because you've been conditioned to accept that's right. an isotope that's right. and when the real thing still exists. Right. And so, so now that's making me think of a lot and go back to the theme of this entire conversation, which is social justice, racial equity, inclusive de democracy, given the ways that phrases like, or terms like social justice yeah. have become, that we've been collectively fed an isotope of social justice yeah. in a contemporary era yeah. that counter your entire presentation about, about the full expression of humanity yeah. of, of LGBTQIA plus folks and things like, like the idea that those, like, like, like listen, we, we're moving for social justice, so that's on the periphery. Talk through, and this is gonna be the one for you, because you're in, on the front lines of this, talk through the isotopes of social justice that we've been collectively forced to ingest and how dangerous that is when folks don't see the fact that we're actually in the absence of social justice in a contemporary era. Yeah. How, how's that showing up for you in your work? Yeah, I'll give you, um, I think in threes, that's the symptom of being related to black uh, religious leaders, um, <laughs> orders in particular. Um, one, one of the greatest lies that we have been fed and that we continue to ingest is that we can find self-protection and in individual privileges, right? This idea that I can perform politics of respectability, I can acquire this job, I can move into this neighborhood, I can prevent myself from having to drive over that bridge to get to that part of this, this city. Mm. All of that is a lie from the pit of DeSantis's hell. Mm -hmm. And in spite of knowing it mm -hmm. um, and seemingly um, getting to the point of watching so much of it literally crumble under the last administration, during the most recent insurrection, and in periods beyond that, we still forget to remember that. Mm -hmm. The second is that the vast majority of us are people with intersectional identities that matter. Yeah. We still play in this space of expecting for people to pick and choose and horse trade. I hope that you heard my frustration in that clip with um, Joy Ann Reed, um, I have no poker face, you can read it if you watch me, mm. but the idea that people expect me at my big age to choose to be either African or the other things that God purposed for me to be, mm -hmm. I find incredibly vexing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In part because the vast majority of people in this room literally have multiple intersectional identities. Facts. And none of us engage in the, hold on, in this moment, you're talking to the black side of me, so let me give you that response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now here's the queer one that's saying, like, it's all the fucking same. Mm. And there are ways in which my learning and development and facility with inviting people in might affect how I show up, but those things are intricately a part of who I am, how I show up, and how I move through the world. Yeah. The last thing is what I named openly at the top of this, which is in my shit is Fannie Lou Hamer's. Mm -hmm which is that the trapping of all of this is to convince us that we can do two things. One is wait until our turn and then they're gonna deal with our thing. Or the other thing that happens is what they usually say is y'all, y'all come on through, y'all good right now. We're gonna move the station for y'all. Mm -hmm. you, you can get your rights right now. Mm -hmm. You can get your access to the things that you otherwise built for free, but, but your cousins, they gotta stay outside. Right, right. Right. It is literally this idea that Fanny's teachings weren't prophetic mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that like freedom doesn't include all of us. And so I find myself most vexed with black people who say to me, when a black trans woman, woman is murdered, they deserved it or should live on an island. Mm -hmm. You sound like a white supremacist. Right, well you are, right? Sounds like a duck quack, like a duck, a hit dog, a holler. Mm. All of that. Mm. And what I struggle with is trying to not assume 
that they understand that they have ingested white supremacy and need rehab. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the space I'm trying to hold. So, so two things. If you, if y'all got questions, then no cards for y'all to ask questions. But we go and keep doing what we do. Um, so, so, a couple things also. Um, when you described your research, you talked about um, the fact that there was certain data that there was no access to, yeah. and that you you had the privilege of having access to particular data. Um, and and then you talked about the quantitative and the qualitative, and then the stuff that you just knew. And you're like, I knew the answer to this before I had the answer. And you just knew it. And then even here, you spoke about, you know, I don't, I don't know if y'all could peep it, but they, um, folks who read my face, even though I didn't say certain things. And so, you, you know, I was, I was at a talk with, with, um, with Fred Moulton the other day, and one of the themes that emerged from me out of it was this concept of the incalculable. Yeah. Um, where folks see your face and you said a whole dissertation and you didn't have to say nothing. Or in the talk, there are just moments in your talk where everyone in here was like, mm. So there was something that was felt. No, they didn't say nothing, but it was said. So like the, the, the reading of your face, the mm in a crowd, the in-betweens in the, in, the, in the data, the interstitial spaces yeah. that aren't here, but we all feel, the incalculable aspect of blackness. I want to talk about how do we find ways to articulate what is incalculable about our experience for folks who don't have the capacity to even understand words. Mm. Much of your research, for me, and I read the joint, I know it, it ain't, the, 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 the dissertation was dope. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. But check this out. The feeling you get yeah. about the world once you've read the dissertation is doper. The presentation is fly. The deep mm's from the gut of the folks who are in the room say yeah. so much more. Yeah. The read on Joanne was fire. But what your face says adds much to it. And I think the beauty of, of blackness is in the incalculable. Yeah. And so how do we quantify the incalculable for folks who have no capacity to read humanity? And, and the reason why I ask you that question is because so much of your presence in the world is your presence in the world. Yeah. yeah. So how, 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 do we, how do we share that with people? How do, we, how do we articulate that to people? How do we invite folks to be able to find their incalculable and their interactions with others themselves? Talk through that for me. I am um, processing everything you're saying um, in this moment and just want to name that. Um, I think what's coming up for me are two things. One is a personal plea in this regard, um, acknowledging this opportunity, which is that I think an answer to that question is you protect people who you know have a light. Hmm. Say um, that again? You protect people you know who have a light or who have an assignment, yeah. um, who are purpose to do a particular work that if they don't do it, it will not be done. Mm -hmm. I believe that that's true for each of us, and I also understand that the anointing isn't um, equal, it's equitable. Mm. Um, and so those of you who understand what I know, which is that I'm purposed to do this work, I'm asking for your protection. Mm. Um, I think that that's a lot of it, Chris, because as thoughtful as I attempt to be, um, there are often moments where I simply devolve to trust in my gut or saying a prayer that whatever I say is going to be the words of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, and there are moments where as a student of the Poet laureate Lauren Hills, I might add an ignorant motherfucker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so people hear me, but that don't always make the elders feel good. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a, you mentioned some, not a delicate balance, but I liken it to like jumping in double dutch where you mm -hmm. got to get in, get out on time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, but you need people who are turning and giving you the cadence to let you know so now a little bit or like, you know, one more um, as you're engaging. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's one part of it. Mm. Uh, the second is we need places of peace. Mm -hmm. um, as I think about this book that I'm birthing, what I'm most thankful for are adults who showed up in the way that I try and show up in the world. Mm -hmm. They were adults who heard the things that others said about me. When I was in elementary school, the word that teachers used when they were trying to be nice was that I was loquacious. It's cute now because I get paid to run this mouth. 
But mm. we celebrate that now again in this moment, mm. but there were but that was designed to prevent me from being able to understand the importance mm -hmm. of using my gifts to be here. Mm -hmm. And so it took educators like Mr. Shaw to call my mom and say, you know, he got a lot of questions, mm -hmm. but let me sit with him and we find the answers mm -hmm. together. Oof. Or other people to show up and say, no, you're not gonna do this to this baby. And then I think the last thing is, um, and I think a lot about your work, Chris, and um, the book before this one for white folks that teach in the hood and all the rest of y'all, I would always talk to educators about the importance of learning to speak the language. And in moments where educators of privilege will say to me that I can't, my response to them would be then simply move the fuck out of the way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the last thing that I'm gonna offer is that everybody's not an educator. <laughs> A child's first and most important teacher are their parents, but everyone is mm -hmm. not an educator. Mm -hmm. People say stupid things like, it's not rock and science, you're right, it's a lot harder. That's right. Right, everybody is not an educator. Mm -hmm. But those of us that have opportunities to get in the way and encourage people to consider alternative professions or not harm that child, that work is important work as well. I don't, uh, there's a part of me that feels like that's not quite the answer that I want to offer, but that's what I got. Oh, no, that, 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 was, that, was, that was the answer you should be offering. I'm going to read some of these now, and I, I surmise what you said to say, that prayers of peace and protection are necessary for folks to be able to speak power in their parables. And, and I think mm -hmm. if I were to quantify what you said, that's interesting because it means then that folks got to pour that, those prayers of peace and protection over themselves and other folks who they see standing in the gap to allow them to keep sustaining their work. And it's important because, you know, when you come and you speak and you share and you unearth and you birth and you give, folks read that and be like, oh, that was, that was, that was powerful. I, I appreciated that. That's not enough. Yeah. Right? You, you've got to serve as a hedge of protection over the folks who are taking the risk to be able to give those parables and those proverbs and that power. And you've got to pour the peace and protection over them as you pour them on yourselves if that's your calling. Y'all hear me? All right, so let me read these here's questions. How, wait, before he does that, let mm. me give this really quickly. Here's how this, here's how this shows up. Mm. Um, I mentioned him already. I'm going to say his name again. Dave Chappelle's had three specials on Netflix, mm -hmm. and he spent all of them um, offering up his fascination with trans folks that mm -hmm. he should be working through in therapy. Mm -hmm. Not this most recent special, but the last special, we issued a release, a statement that essentially said, this is problematic, he, free speech. He going the thing is on Netflix, watch it if you want to, but it's problematic. It reduces black people to all being cisgendered and straight. It reduces all gay people and trans people to being white. And in this is that every year since I have been in this role with MBJC, it's been the deadliest year on record for black trans women. Mm. The deadliest year on record. And most people think that the um, um, average life expectancy is 33 for black trans women. We, that data point is really about the proliferation of death. Mm. that happens around that, that age, mm. right? Like, this is a thing that I know. So what most people took from the statement was NBJC asked for Dave Chappelle to be canceled. Mm. And the hardest part about this, Chris, was black folks who were like, David and NBJC is blackface for a white queer organization. Mm. Mm -hmm. Black folks. Mm -hmm. The thing that made the difference when I'm getting death threats, mm -hmm. when... My mentors are, 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 are trying to convince me to move out of my dwelling, get a whole new phone, run and hide. Mm. The thing that made the difference were people who knew my work, mm -hmm. who took up space publicly to be like, fuck that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's what they do. Mm -hmm. Here's the evidence of it. And if you got something to say, say it to me. Yeah. And in this world of social media where so many of us are fearful to engage in discourse that might become uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important for those of us who do work that offers us up to the public to have people who know us who mm -hmm. won't be afraid to defend. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Which then just countered what I previously said because the prayers of protection and peace are not enough in that instance. No, people... If you, if you are a prayer person like my man Andre or like Reverend Brittany Packard, you got Jesus on the main line, keep praying. Yeah. 
<laughs> but but if you ain't got no relationship to the source, then, don't then we got it. other stuff yeah. that you can do. Damn, you you can you can add to the to the bail collection yeah. fund because yeah. I'm always liable to go to jail. Yeah. You like there there there's work for every, there's there's there there are no light people in this work. Yeah. Prayers are important again for people who have meaningful and deep connections. Yeah. But too often we play and perform mm -hmm. when people say, and I'm going to pray for you. If you don't pray, don't pray for me. Yeah. You can yeah. make an investment in this work. Yeah. 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 You, can, you, can, yeah. you can introduce me to the white person you know that is investing in all these other organizations that purport to do the work, yeah, yeah. but don't. Yeah, that's real. There's, there's work for everybody. That's fire. Yeah, yeah. Damn, son. All right. So, yeah. I'm going to try to read some of these. Um, uh, this question says, how do you find your peace in the urgency? Everything is on fire, but it's been on fire. So how do you exist in urgency and peace and holding yourself together? Mm, what's the next question? <laughs> okay, so um, I'll give you, I'll give you but, three. You know, but you know, here's the thing. It's also okay to say, I don't know. You know, I think, I think that's okay for, in, in seasons like these, also, I think the beauty of these kind of conversations and also just like all of this is that it ain't got to, it doesn't have to be polished, it doesn't have to be tied up. I think, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the question and be like, we don't know and we figured it out. Like, look at it, read it. So three things. Uh, words matter mm. and, and everything is not on fire. Hmm. Uh, the fact that we are sitting in this space, Amen. named after Dr. Martin, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. III, mm. five days before his birthday. I told you I was happening this month. Thank you, God. <laughs> um, that I, an African descendant, can be a free Negro, mm -hmm. empowered to do the job that I have now, mm -hmm. is evidence of the fact that not everything is on fire. Facts. Um, so this is me turning down the white noise. Mm -hmm. um, and I find peace in the urgency of doing the work, knowing that I stand in a long line of race warriors that continue to mm -hmm. speak to and through me. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I try to calibrate appreciating my unique role mm. in all of this. And then the third thing is this. Um, <laughs> I got like five songs running through my head in this moment. Mm. Um, but the word peace means something different to me now that I am in a loving relationship. Mm. Yeah. I, um, uh, my partner who's sitting to my left is saved in my phone as my peace, P-E-A-C-E. Y'all don't try it. Mm. <laughs> um, because one thing he said to me um, that the ancestor spoke through him on was that he understood that a part of his responsibility in life was to ensure that I have peace. Mm -hmm. And in the two years, three months mm. that we have been in relationship, he's done <laughs> just that. Yeah. Um, and so I'm naming that um, mm. I understand that a part of peace is not completely in one's control. And as hard as I've worked to prove that you could be fine by your damn self, mm. it's simply not true. We're not purposed to do this alone. So yeah. I think a, a part of the piece is to have yeah. people that will be and provide peace for you. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, beautiful. And man, and it, it, when you talked about about your partner's identification of the responsibility, I, I just makes me think of the fact that everybody, everybody has a responsibility. Very few choose to enact a responsibility, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think what I think mm -hmm. what love does is it says, yeah, I have a responsibility, but I am going to enact the ability to respond to whatever comes your way, and that's. Magic, yeah. and then another other thing I'm thinking of in this moment, just thinking back about that question, is that, um, you know, when it feels like everything's on fire, it don't mean everything is always burning down. Sometimes it means that when the world is cold, That's right. we find warmth. That's right. You know, sometimes, like for me, it's like, yo, 
I like it. I like to feel a little fire in my belly because it reminds me that I'm not asleep. That's right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's like, right. And I think I think that's another beautiful thing too. Like, don't look at the fire as it being destroyed. Sometimes look at the fire as evidence that you're still alive and living and here and can do. And don't be distracted by mediocre white people who are just waking up. Mm. So many of my frustrating moments in the last three years have come with being in rooms with white people who for the first time feel like things just aren't fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, and they suck up not only all the oxygen out of the room, but they then skip, they skip over the fact that like, we didn't been through this shit. So a lot, a number of times I've been in spaces like, let me introduce you to Fannie Lou Hamer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can, can, can we just try in this space, just let's just try to enact a rule that white people just don't speak. They just listen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's also a part of this for me too. Right. Teach the babies. One last question. Oh, man, I'm so sorry, y'all. I just like talking to them. Let, so me, I, see, I, let yeah. me see Oh, pick one. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, oh, good. Hi, um, my name's Angel Miles. Um, Dr. Angel Love Miles. Hey. Come on. Good out there. Uh, um, and uh, I wanted to ask you, um, well, one, I wanted to point out that Fannie Lou Hamer was a black woman with a disability. Yes, she was. So, um, yes, she and, was. Uh, if you haven't read um, Until I Am Free by Dr. Um, Keisha, Keisha Blaine. I That's think. exactly she, right. Yeah, she she talks about that intersection some, and so I wanted to um, to to talk to touch on that just a moment because you did bring up queerness and and how it you know it's related to um, otherness in general, but you were speaking about it in sexuality specifically, and so we're talking about teaching the babies, and what about the the group that is often perceived as unteachable, which are children with disabilities, mm -hmm. and how black children have specifically, well, black people in general have high rates of disability, mm -hmm. um, and and black people, um, black children have high rates of disability. Both to some, it's it's debatable about you know how much they're overrepresented and under in in special education, or are they, um, you know, under under uh, resourced. It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I, I just wanted to know because as someone who is uh, a black woman with a, with a disability who comes in with all those things and has experienced a lot of racial justice spaces that just aren't accessible and, yeah. and, and have not embraced disability justice, which I would encourage more people to look into because it, it's already doing all that intersectional work. Uh, multiple marginalized disabled people are already doing all that yeah. work because we have to. Yeah. You know, so I can't live in a world that is um, is racist but it's not accessible. That's right. right? Mm -hmm. um, and even in the MLK's um, library that's brand new, which I think is great, still has not imagined me sitting anywhere but there. Like everywhere yeah. I go, like there's just, I wanted to do a, a color purple uh, um, viewing and I wanted to invite all my disabled friends and then I realized I can't invite but like two or three of my friends in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Because like, and I, we can't choose where we're gonna sit because they decided we gonna only sit here, here, mm. here, 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 here. Or and you show up like Reverend Barber and then they show their ass. Exactly, mm. right. They show up then and they're like, and they take your, you know, whatever, whatever. So anyway, um, not trying to um, do what some people- No, we here, don't what, apologize. What, what, yeah. what about is, but really just pointing out that there, how blackness is has been constructed in relationship to disability, yeah. like always. Um, yeah. and, and that disability, is, there is an erasure um, that often when we talk about you know black people who have been leaders or even you know black people who have been shot by the police and the, the degree to which um, ableism has also contributed to that because a lot of those people that we say say their names had disabilities right. and, and and ableism contributed to them being shot just as much as racism did right. right and it's not an either or thing so yeah. one we need to look at uh, oppression right and how oppression expresses itself in multiple ways like sometimes i mean I, I i respect identity politics i'm proud of all my identities but i also think that sometimes we lose sight of identity politics because we're not thinking about just being anti-oppression first and then thinking about how it's expressing itself in yeah. in homophobia how That's it's expressing right. itself in transphobia and ableism misogyny, and, and all these trans misogyny, misogyny and all the different things um you know and um you know, and, and all these other things. So anyway, I didn't want to say um, mm. much more um, because, I mean, we could talk another time, but when they said, like, you need to write this down. Listen, Tony, y'all, next time y'all, the doctor need to do a talk. Mm. The doctor needs to do a talk. Gotcha. Well, I'm here, but, you know, they also need, but just even this, like, the space, they, like, they didn't imagine that, you know, like, where's the ramp? Like, yeah. I got to roll up to mm. this. Like, mm. like, like things are not structured. It's, a, it's um, called compulsory ableness. That's right. The assumption mm. that the, the society is set up on default 
as able, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. and that everybody else just has to accommodate. But if, if the world was run by wheelchair users, right. then y'all would have to go to Disability Sports Services and request chairs because, right. and you have to get accommodations. That's right. So the idea that disabled people are somehow strange because we're always asking for accommodations where able-bodied people are getting accommodated every day. Mm-hmm. It's just, mm-hmm. so it's really an issue of power, just mm-hmm. like any mm-hmm. other. That's right, especially, the, y'all give Dr. a round of applause. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm. But yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the disabled people mm. and um, that you, especially in the queer community, um, and um, you know, have you encountered? Yeah, them? I'm about to do that right now. Dara, stand up. Dara Baldwin, right here, is a dear friend and one of the fiercest Dara, advocates Dara's in this space. I already Dara. know you know Dara, but I want to make sure everybody knows Dara, <laughs> who keeps us together on this issue. I want to lift up the name of Alyssa Thompson, a uh, dear fun. sister who does yeoman's work mm. in this regard. Um, and I want to also highlight Ify I who'd you say? Carrie Gray. Carrie Gray as well. There are thoughtful people who do this work. And as I name them, I also want to highlight the challenge of us assuming that our folks who live with disabilities are going to be the one to do this work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's the same dynamic that comes up when people yep. are like, oh, David, you can't leave a room now to go use the bathroom because you're about to get to the gay shit. Mm-hmm. It's all of our shit. Mm-hmm. And so we need to do a better job in that regard. If, yeah. if you didn't hear me say it earlier, just to underscore what our good doctor said, most black people are born with, are made to have a disability mm. over the course of our lifetimes. Mm-hmm. It vexes me that even in the way that we talk about and imagine disabilities that we don't even think as much as we should about hidden or not visible mm. disabilities mm. or the diversity that exists within that space. Mm-hmm. And if we do a better job of something that we attempted to do during COVID, which is to provide accommodations for people as they need them, mm we wouldn't have some of the issues that we find ourselves having in spaces like this, Mm. in schools and in the workspace. The last person I name in this regard is my partner Andre, who does this work for DC government. Um, He does person-centered thinking to make sure that employers in DC are being more mindful of some of these Mm. dynamics. Um, And we can have a whole nother conversation about this. We in fact should. Uh, because I don't want nobody cussing me out and they haven't cussed, uh, turned off my microphone. Somebody asked about intercommunity work over the next three to five years beyond the expected y'all got to vote to heal, unlearn, internalize white supremacy and become safe um, and loving spaces for one another. Um, I love the person that asked this question and I want to invite everybody to write down March for Equity, Juneteenth. Mm. NBJC is producing a March for Equity and a Ball for Equity Mm. and related activities so you can learn about the history of ballroom and to practice ballroom dancing and to center equity, Mm -hmm. right? A part of what we talked about, the isotopes, is that we get distracted in talking about this policy issue or this person. If we all are oriented around equity, we can find ways to get free. So I'm gonna offer that up as our intercommunal work, as well as everybody having a good therapist. For me, good therapy means that you do work outside of the session. If you ain't doing no work outside of the session, throw them away. I wanna name that somebody wrote a question about naming neurodiversity. I think that there is more conversation about it and we are appreciative that there are more of us who are living with what has been natural and normal for for most of us here too for. Someone asked about some some objectives that I use that I find to be effective with making teach the babies not overwhelming. Am I reading this right? I have a hard time with this because I try not to regard others in doing the thing that I feel purpose or called to do. Sometimes I acknowledge that it's like too much for folks. That's fine, but also that's on you. If y'all watch Real Housewives uh, Beverly Hills, this was Garcelle giving it to Dorit last week. I aspire <laughs> to that energy. Like, that's fine, beloved. You are racist and want to hide behind your mm. ethnicity. That's on you. I'm not taking that on me. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question, but also let's continue after this. The last one, the very last one is, what is victim mentality? How does this help or not help liberation work? Victim mentality is one of those words like anti-woke that was created by white supremacist fascists. Mm. It's a way for us to be distracted from people advocating for themselves. Necromancy. Yeah. From people advocating for themselves, from knowing in a deep sacred place that our desire is always to get free, Mm -hmm. to get closer to liberation, to get closer to the source, to be in relationship with our ancestors, to be in community with the higher being. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we are um, playing victim 
or are mired in the conditions that have been created for us is, in a, is a distraction. It's, a, it's an attempt to keep us from doing that which we are purposed to do. So my prayer is that we are critical thinkers in the spirit of bell hooks, that we nurture the parts of our young selves that only want to ask why, 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 especially when it comes to words like this mm -hmm. that are designed to prevent us from getting closer to freedom. And, and, and real quick too, and also identifying who, who, who is, like identifying a system, a structure, a, a, a power wielder who has created everything to support their own identity, who is actually enacting victim mentality. Like you got everything, and, you're, and any iota of your power being given to anybody else, you start tripping. Yeah. Like, you are, you, you are the exemplification of the thing that you're naming in anybody else. Like, that's the part that's wild to me. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, the enactor of the phenomena looking at everybody else and saying, look at you playing victim when you got anything constructed for you and you're trying to be a victim. Like, it's wild. I'm sorry. It's just wild. No, it is wild. It's, all, it's like the maddening thing around us having conversations with the failed history teacher in Florida around the reclamation of terms that actually mean things. Mm. <laughs> like, words mean things, and that we are asked to pretend like they don't mm. is a game that we should just not engage in. Man, listen, I can't. So as we land this plane, I want to end where I begin. You, want, you have a question, brother? They're going to kick me out of here. Go that for it. Was, that was Which term? Um, well, victim. Victim mentality. Got it. Um, in, the, in, the, in the realm of DEI, and I'm not a victim. I'm not trying to be a victim. But you know, I saw, I've been wrestling with that. Mm. Like, how is this helping? What does that mean? Because I've never used it. I've never been a victim like in, in that regard. Mm. And so, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd want to unpack and get to the root of what they mean when they say that, and have a better sense of why. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would love to validate that if you are a black person or a queer person in this country, then you are what? A victim of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That's real. And then for me, the question is, how do we move through that, get you the healing and support you need in order to show up and thrive in spite of? Um, and so I just want to name that, for me, words matter. I will argue over a comma, a period, a sentence as it relates to policy. That's what we do. Gotcha. And I also, to go back to channeling the babies, try and be graceful with appreciating how people come to terms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I know is that some of y'all are gonna tell your friends about this talk, that gay boy did good. I don't use the term gay, I use same gender loving. I'm not gonna cuss you out around it, but I'm gonna remind you that I identify as same gender loving. So it's important for us to always be in pursuit of more precise language to get closer mm -hmm. to closing the gap between us mm -hmm and to give grace to acknowledge that there is flexibility in it as well. Beautiful. I want to say thank you again to Chanel and Ryan for thinking it important enough to invite me in this space to follow in the footsteps of friends like Brittany Packner Cunningham. If you are not listening to or subscribe to her podcast, you should download it now. We are on hiatus, but we're coming back. We're coming back. Um, I know a lot of you are going to ask about this beautiful sweater that I have on. Some of you already have. I have two friends, Cassandra stand up, Neosha stand up. Neosha's got the t-shirt version of it. Hey. This is a product of a collaboration with a black woman named Brianna who has a company called Stoop and Stank. Y'all write this down so you don't have to ask me later. It's Stoop and Stank. If you just go in there and search Teach the Babies or Dr. David Johns, you can find it. Um, and the last thing is just to say thank you to my brother, Dr. Chris. This is your sweater. Thank you. Um, in addition to being brilliant, you all got a dose of it. Um, Chris is going to sign some books later. He has a number of them. Um, uh, for white folks that teach in the hood and all the rest of y'all is my favorite, if only because of the title. Um, but it also brings to light, life rather, uh, which is a source of light. Um, Chris's work in helping our babies unlock their genius and being able to articulate it using language that white people lie to us about as not being naturally ours. This is the, the science of it all, the genius of it all. Um, and so my hope is that you all will say thank you to him for accepting my invitation to engage in this conversation tonight to say thank you, brother. Friends, friends and family, give it up for Dr. Emden and Dr. Johns. 
Uh, just a few housekeeping. Um, just a few housekeeping reminders. Um, uh, the library.